the Mesa College STEM Lecture Series. Um, tonight we're going to have the first talk of the semester, and so I'm really pleased to be here and, and see all of you here. Um, today I'd like to introduce two speakers, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Charlotte Oluse Hammond and Martin Molnar. Um, Charlotte comes with a, a BS in Biochemistry, Cell and Molecular Biology, and she also has a Master's Degree in Biotechnology and Bioinformatics. Um, she has an extensive background in microbiology, and she's worked with drug sensitivities in various microorganisms, including pathogens, disease-causing organisms, and uh, the study of uh, diseases like tuberculosis and malaria. Um, she's currently in a CIRM Bridges Research Fellow, working um, with stem cells in the Gleason Laboratory. Uh, she works with pediatric brain disease um, at UC San Diego. Martin, um, he has a BSc in Environmental Science, um, a Master's in Biotechnology and Bioinformatics, and an MBA as well. Um, he's a research associate at the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine, and he conducts research on cystic fibrosis, um, specifically specializing in stem cells and their differentiation. Um, Martin and Charlotte, they actually sought me out. They really wanted to have the opportunity not just to speak to all of us about the work that they do, but also really interested in outreach, talking to uh, students about alternative careers in science, not just that traditional route. And so, you know, while many of you are trying to consider what it is you'd like to do, you know, that, that's, that's something I'd, I'd really like for you to think about as well. And so um, I hope that you'll help me in welcoming both Charlotte and Martin as they talk about brains in a dish, stem cells, and their applications. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome and uh, kind words on our. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for um, inviting us to start off the semester. And let me share the presentation. So before I talk about stem cells, um, really quickly I want to kind of talk about why we're here or why I'm here specifically in the first, in the first place, why I chose stem cells. And the reason is that I believe basically that currently in the natural sciences there isn't any other field, not physics, not quantum stuff, not electronics, not chemistry, that's nearly as interesting or has such implications as, as what we are cu currently doing in biology. It's by far the most interesting thing that we have. Um, that's why a lot of people say that we are currently living in historic times. A lot of people refer to what um, we are living in currently as the century of biology. And for instance, Think about the 20th century. A lot of people consider it the century of physics. The reason for that is that, and think about all the discoveries that were made in physics in the 20th century. General relativity, special relativity, um, particle physics, quantum, um, quantum mechanics, consumer electronics became a thing basically in what, 70 years? And not only were we making strides in, in the theoretical realm, we were also paired with that making huge advances in the application of those theoretical discoveries. And that's pretty much the same thing that's going on in biology right now today. Um, a lot of people seem to be agreeing with me. So this is just a graph of uh, preprints available in bioinformatics and as you can see, it's increasing exponentially and it shows no signs of stopping. So biology is just pumping and pumping out research. So why are we referring to our current times as the century of biology specifically? Where well, here is a few milestone um, achievements that we have made in the past 30 years. For instance, in uh, 91, we eradicated polio entirely in the Western Hemisphere. We cloned a sheep successfully in 96. Um, in 1999, we printed an organ, given it's a bladder, it's not a very complicated organ, but we actually implanted it into a human and it worked just fine. In uh, 2003, the Human Genome Project came to a conclusion after about 
what, 10, 15 years, we sequenced the entire human genome. In 2010, we made the first synthetic organism, which means that someone designed the entire genome of that organism. So this was um, human designed and it worked, it was alive. We wrote the genetic code for it. In 2012, um, CRISPR-Cas9 became a thing. I'm sure everyone has heard of CRISPR. And last but not least, in 96, for the first time, we isolated human stem cells. So let's um, talk a little bit about how we got here. This is the very first microscope that was used to discover the first cells. So in the 1600s, and this is, this is in the middle of the Renaissance, like the plague was still making the rounds. Someone built this absurd thing. I look at a microscope all day, every day, and I wouldn't know what this is unless it was labeled. Um, yeah, they used this to discover cells. And does anyone happen to know what the first human cell was that uh, Leeuwenhoek used to, um, Leeuwenhoek discovered using this microscope? First human cell. Yes. Bacteria? No, no, human cell. Oh. Just guessing, maybe a cheek cell? Okay, okay, good guess, no. <laughs> Sorry? A red blood cell? A red blood cell, exactly. Great grass. Does anyone happen to know what the second cell was? Second human cell? The white one? <laughs> uh, yeah, but not, not. It was a sperm cell. So, yeah, priorities. <laughs> yeah. yeah, bacteria weren't actually discovered until like 10 years later after that. So. Yeah, and this was in the 1660s, so it took us about 200 more years to understand that cells aren't just, you know, cool little boxes that exist under the microscope that only kings and queens and some weird guy with whatever this is um, gets to see, but it's really the basic unit of life. It's one of the foundations of modern biology, cell theory. Um, cell is the basic unit of life, and cells don't just arise out of nowhere. Only a cell can make another cell. That took us about 200 years to really understand. And this is in the 1900s. So you can see that by the 1900s, we pretty much understood that cells make other cells, but also other cell types. I mean, these are remarkably similar. And because cells only can make other cells, there has to be a cell that uh, is the progenitor to another cell. And they also differentiate. We knew that there has to be something, right? There has to be one cell that all other cells stem from, if you get what I mean, what I'm trying to allude there, very subtly. So before I get any more into stem cells, I, I think it would be interesting to see uh, what people think about stem cells before I corrupt you. Um, <laughs> does anyone think that it's unethical? Does anyone know if it's legal or not? Go for it, I'm, I'm interested. I will guarantee you that if you do think it's unethical, which some people might, I will guarantee you you will not be bullied for it, won't stand for it. There's no right answer, it's morals. Anyone think it's unethical? Good. <laughs> so in uh, 2001, they were outlawed for a while, actually. Um, George Bush decided to veto the Stem Cell Research, uh, Research Enhancement Act. And I read the entire act, it's actually pretty reasonable. It says only cells left over from IVF can be used. Um, these cells should and would never be implanted, and it re requires the written consent of the people that the IVF cells came from, and there is not allowed to be any financial incentives for the people. Right? But uh, it passed the House, it passed the Senate, but um, the President vetoed it. Um, and this created a really weird kind of legal framework because, as you might have noticed, we already had stem cells, 
by that time. Like people were already culturing embryonic stem cells. So some embryos were already destroyed. Like why discard that? So they made a smart little loophole saying that despite there not being any federal funds available from this point on for stem cells, you could um, use stem cell lines that were already established. So it was a really, really weird time in science. But in 2009, um, Obama issued an executive order basically undoing it, which was pretty much symbolic for reasons I will go into soon. So what is a stem cell? Anyone, um, anyone have a definition? That's a stem cell. OK, thank you for coming to my talk. See you on the next No, well, if I did this 30 years ago, I would have got a Nobel Prize for it. But stem cells are unspecialized cells that have not yet decided what type of adult cell they will be. Stem cells can also differentiate into multiple different cell types, including themselves. So that means that they can multiply indefinitely. And there is only two types of cell that can multiply indefinitely. Anyone know the other cell type? Cancer, exactly. Not, not saying that you know, embryos and cancer have anything else in common. Call for. So the official, more scientific um, definition of what a stem cell actually is, is that any cell that is able to do both symmetric and asymmetric division. That means that when a cell divides, it can either do symmetric division, so a stem cell splits into two stem cells, or a stem cell splits into two cells that are not stem cells but it can also do asymmetric division. That means that it can split into a cell that's a stem cell, but also not a stem cell. So this is the official definition for what a stem cell is. Do adults have stem cells in their bodies? Okay, who thinks that adults have stem cells in their bodies? Hands up. Okay, okay. Who thinks that adults do not have stem cells in their bodies? Great, nobody's wrong. There's actually many, many different types of stem cells in the human body. They're just not embryonic. They're not embryonic stem cells. So see, in basically every tissue, there is some sort of stem cell that can differentiate into not every cell type, but some cell types. We call that multipotency. There's also some other cell types, such as um, induced pluripotent stem cells and these are really the most interesting, I think, out of the bunch. But before we get into that, let's, um, let's try and explain what an embryonic stem cell is. So for that, I need to stop touching. For that, um, let's discuss what a placenta is first. Does anyone know what a placenta is? Yeah, exactly. It's actually that, but it's it's an organ. Yeah, it's it's an organ. So does anyone know what makes this organ? Trophoblast. Yes, it's the trophoblast. And yeah. <laughs> well, well, the kicker is that the trophob I mean, the placenta is a it's an organ in the mother's body, but it's not the mother's body that makes it. It's generated by the embryo. So that's um, it's weird to think about. So what an embryonic stem cell is, um, basically, this um, oocyte is going to start differentiating from one cell into two cells, into four cells, into eight cells, into 16 cells. And at 16 cells, it's at the morula phase. The morula phase, it has 16 cells, and all of these 16 cells are still the same as when the fertilization happened. So these are totipotent, which means that they can become any of the three 
germ layer, so any cells that form your body, but also the placenta. And it's at this, it's at this stage at 16 cells where they are going to differentiate the first time. This is the first time that cells start to specialize in, in embryonic development. And they form the blastocyst. And the blastocyst consists of the outer cell mass, which is trophoblast. It's going to become the trophoblast and then the placenta. And it consists of the inner cell mass, which is where the embryonic stem cells come from. This is really important for um, one, one fact is, uh, the reason it's important is that, you know what's worse than having cancer in your lungs? Having a placenta in your lungs. Like, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna mix this up. You only want the embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are what we call pluripotent, so they can form any cell in your body. And once they start differentiating from here onward, they differentiate into one of these three major directions and they will give rise to the rest of your body. This is a, a quick timeline of how, um, how stem cells were discovered incrementally, basically. I will just start from here because it's easier. So mouse embryonic stem cells were first isolated in 1981. But the discovery of LIF only happened in 1988. What LIF does, the reason this is important, is because you need this to culture embryonic stem cells in a dish. If you take out uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, they're not going to stay stem cells. You can't keep them alive, and you can't keep them stem cells. They're going to start to differentiate and become other cell types. So this is absolutely integral. Um, human embryonic stem cells were first isolated in 98. And then in uh, 2007, we get to um, induce pluripotent stem cells. So how do you prove that you are dealing with embryonic stem cells? And this is a really important question. There are three main experiments you can perform to make sure that you are dealing with stem cells. And the very first one is just to expand them in culture, just keep growing stem cells, because as we discussed earlier, stem cells can um, expand indefinitely. And they can also become every other tissue in your body. So as long as you can keep this cell culture alive indefinitely, it's a pretty good, um, pretty, good, pretty good sign that you're dealing with stem cells. But you also need to be able to form all three different main tissue types or, or um, layers in, in uh, your body. But the problem is that you know, it took 10 years to get these cells to be, um, to be culturing in the dish. So what they did until then to, to really prove that they really isolated embryonic stem cells is they formed a teratoma. Does anyone know what a teratoma is? Oh, really? Are they benign? Uh, no. It was just a... Oh. It had hair and teeth. Exactly. So a teratoma is a very specific type of tumor. It's a tumor that has um, all three major germ layer cells. So it has all different cell types from all around your body. So like um, the lady over there said, it had hair, it had teeth, it has all different tissues that can be found in a body. I'm going to show a picture of it real quick. It's kind of gross, so if you, um, if you don't do well with gross stuff, you can look away. I'll tell you when it's over. I'm going to start it now. Yeah, you can see the different tissue types, and I'm going to click away now. Okay, so this is something um, that was back in the day a gold standard for determining that something is uh, an embryonic stem cell because you can grow them in culture to see if they eventually form all three different germ layers. Um, you implant them in a mouse. And if the mouse gets a teratoma, that tumor has all three different germ layers in it, 
then you can be sure that it's an embryonic stem cell. Um, experiment number three that you can use to determine if you isolated an embryonic stem cell or if you didn't is that if you have a blastocyst and you remove the embryonic stem cells from the middle of it, you could theoretically take those embryonic stem cells, put them in another blastocyst, and uh, an animal should develop, you know, you put it back together. So technically, theoretically, the embryos should um, you know, continue to grow and become a whole animal. And that's exactly what they did, and they were successful. So now we get to induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, they were discovered in 2006 slash 2007 for human stem cells. And um, yeah, by Shinya Yamanaka, and he received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for it in 2012, which is a, a record. Like, you don't usually get a Nobel Prize that quick after doing your scientific work. So how this works is he looked at embryonic stem cells and really thought about, okay, what makes these cells stem cells? Like, what proteins do they have? What genes do they express? And he found that there are 24 possible genes that could be the cause of embryonic stem cells being embryonic stem cells. So he started to look at them one by one. And it's a lot of work, but he found out that these four genes that produce these four proteins are the ones responsible for, um, yeah, for making a stem cell a stem cell. So where do you go from here? Well, you could try and put these proteins into a cell, see what happens. And that's exactly what he did. And what happened is that he managed to turn a differentiated skin cell back into a stem cell. So you can take cells from all around your body, a hair, uh, a hair cell, skin cell, most likely skin, and turn it back into a stem cell. And this is huge because now you don't need embryonic stem cells for stem cell research anymore. Also, you can create stem cells that come from your own body. They are going to have the same genetics as you. If you need a donor organ, you can just grow them up from stem cells that were made from your skin. It's uh, basically the future of medicine. So here's a difficult question. How do we know that these um, induced pluripotent stem cells are like embryonic stem cells? If they're exactly the same, you should be able to um, perform the same tests on them like you did for the mouse embryonic stem cells, except in humans this time. So we can expand them in culture see if they go on forever, see if they differentiate into all different cell types. Um, we can see if they form a teratoma. That's, um, yeah, we run into problems. We start running into problems because you can't just take cells, put them in a person, and see if they develop a tumor. That's, you're not going to get research funding for that. But we can put them in a mouse and see if the mouse develops a human tumor, which it does. And number three, the, the chimera experiment is what they call it when you take, um, you know, take these induced pluripotent stem cells, you put them in a blastocyst and see if they form a fully grown animal. Well, yeah, you also obviously can't do this. Really unethical. You would probably go to jail if you tried doing that to a human being. Tests that, uh, these are modern tests you can actually um, do to see if the cells you are dealing with are induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, the reason I'm showing this to you, that if you're interested in stem cells and want to work with them, let's say you become a laboratory technician, these are probably standard uh, tests that you will be performing. One of them is um, alkaline phosphate staining. So you just take a stain and put it on the cells and if they stain very highly, good, stem cell. Um, the other test you can perform is the Yamanaka factors, which um, the guy got the Nobel Prize for, those four genes. 
you can test those. You can uh, stain them, and you can see if the cells express all four of them. And if they do, it's again a pluripotent stem cell. Um, OK. So the reason, um, as I discussed before, induced pluripotent stem cells are so interesting is because if you have some genetic disorder, you can just take cells from a person and make them, uh, let's say, start growing them into, to give you a specific example, you have cystic fibrosis. We can take some skin cells from you, we can turn them into stem cells, and we can slowly start to guide the stem cells to become lung cells. And the lung that grows in the dish is going to have the exact same cystic fibrosis that you have. So it's used for disease model. Another thing that you can do is um, you can actually try and fix the cystic fibrosis in these cells that's growing in the culture and then put the lung cells back into you, see if uh, maybe it cures you. That's why, that's why stem cells are a big deal. So how much of this can we actually do? How much of this can we actually get done? Well, we can generate patient-specific disease models. That's what Charlotte does. That's what I do. We use this in hospital pretty, uh, hospitals pretty routinely. Stem cell therapies are currently not possible. I will go into this later. Lab-grown organs are, other than, I guess, bladders, not possible. Organ printing is not feasible yet. And anti-aging is also not a thing yet. So, um, this is how organ printing actually works, if you're interested in it. So they take this embryonic stem cell goop you mesh it all up, you put some um, collagen in there, so it kind of stays goopy enough to form a 3D uh, shape, not just you know, stay 2D like a liquid. And this is the most complex thing we can print right now, which is a tiny little human heart. But um, yeah, no one's going to benefit from this one. This is. Um, a lab-grown heart, and this was made from a single stem cell, and they guided it along the specialization, the differentiation process, all the way until it can actually beat in culture, which is really cool to see. Um, yeah, this is just a quick warning. So stem cell therapies are all over the place. Like everyone um, has probably heard of the potential of stem cells. And there is about 10,000 clinical studies right now for stem cells if you go on um, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, there is about 1,000 of them that are in phase three, but there's only 27 FDA, uh, FDA approved gene therapy products which means that, um, yeah, if you're sitting here, you're probably not going to benefit from any. What it is going to do to you is if they implant, let's say, real stem cells into you, they, join, they scan you just half the way, um, you're going to develop a tumor, like the mice. Yeah, the FDA has warnings about this. The CDC has warnings about this. The FTC has warnings about this. Um, yeah, just, just stay away from stem cell therapies for now, they're probably a scam. And uh, with that, I'm going to give the mic to Charlotte. All right, good evening. And um, I'm Charlotte, and I'm presenting on stem cell therapy in autism. So um, like Martin said, um, stem cells are any, part, any cells in your body that haven't decided yet on which cell type they are going to be. So um, I work with induced pluripotent stem cells from patients. And basically what we do, and it's being transcribed to RNA, and that RNA is translated into a protein and that protein is functional in the body. So that protein is maybe coding for your hair, 
is coding for something functional in your body. Now that um, RNA can also be re um, reverse transcribed into DNA, and this is seen in viruses like the HIV virus, where they, re they reverse transcribe the RNA into DNA and they insert it into the, the human genome. So the person like has the HIV virus, whoever has HIV has the HIV virus in their genome. So, um, so now I do um, work with um, autistic patients and um, I'll first define autism as a spectrum that would depend on others for survival. So um, now it's said that from research we've discovered that um, there's a genetic base for autism. So most of the autistic children have a gene that is mutated and is causing them to be autistic. Now, um, it could either be that there's a um, loss of function mutation or there's a gain of function mutation. So when I say this, I mean that, let's say we have a gene different from this. So we are saying that if this protein is produced, this protein is what is going to drive that disease progression. So what can we do? We can target the disease here so that this is not made. So um, that is what we are saying. Now, how are we going to target this? We will need the gene from the diseased patient, and we are going to work with four genes. Now, these genes are PAX1, AXXL3, PPP2R5D, and SYNGAP1. Now these genes have a single point mutation in them. And it's, so for three of these genes, there's a PAX1, AXXL3, and PP2R5D, they have a toxic gain of function mutation, meaning that the, the gene has a mutation in there, in, in there that is causing a protein that is toxic to be made, and that protein is causing the disease progression. Now, for SYNGAP1, it has a loss of function mutation, meaning that there's a protein that needs to be made, but because there's a mutation in that gene, that protein is not made, or the levels of the protein that is made drops. So if we need 100% of that protein to be made, we are making like 20%, because maybe just one copy allele of that gene is producing the healthy copy and the other is not producing at all because we have a single point mutation in there. Now, um, so ASO therapy, this is antisense oligonucleotide therapy. It targets the disease at the mRNA level. So um, ASOs are like, they are modified DNA. So they are modified DNA, we have a DNA that we, modif we modify the flanking edges such that they are able to bind to the mRNA. And once they bind to the mRNA, depending on the type of ASO, it's going to elicit its effect. Now we have two types of ASOs. We have the gamma ASO and the Mixma ASO. The gamma ASOs are, de they are designed such a way that we modify the flanking edges of the short sequence of DNA, and this DNA is going to bind to your mRNA. And it binds here. So once it binds, there's an enzyme in the body that is called the RNSH. RNSH will recognize, it will recognize DNA RNA duplex. And it's recruited, once it recognizes that there's a DNA RNA duplex somewhere in the body, it just comes and it will degrade it. It will cut that side off. And once you cut it off, RNAs in the body will come and further degrade it. So once it's degraded, the transcript is going down, and there's a knockdown, and you're not gonna get this protein formed. So that's the, the um, strategy we are using to target autism. So we have, um, we also have the Mixma ASOs. Now the MISMA ASOs is supposed to restore 
the functional production of a functional protein. So with the Mixma ASOs, they are fully modified oligos. So we modify it such that when it binds to wherever you want it to bind, your pre mRNA, it's going to, it's, it's like a steric ASO. It's going to, we have something we call a poison exon. The poison exon has a stop codon in there. So once you um, join um, RNA splicing, the poison exon makes the, um, it makes the RNA go to nonsense mediated decay. So it, it just stops. So let's say um, we have, okay. So we have our RNA here, and this is a stop code. This is our intron, this is our intron, and this is our exon. The intron, they don't code for anything. During splicing, they are cut out, and the exon is the only thing that codes for the protein. So normally, with the Mixma ASOs, they target the exonic regions that have a poison exon. So it means this is a, um, is a stop codon. So once the, um, the polymerase finds that um, there's a stop codon here, it just it stops everything. And this protein that supposed to be made from this is not made. So what our Mixma ASO does is that it's going to block such that this whole thing can be made. So this will not be recognized. So there's going, it's going to block this. And this, the, the, it can read and we can get our protein. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yeah, so that's what the Mixma ASO does. So we, for that one, we fully modify all the nucleotide. Depending on, for if you modify it fully, it's expensive. But if you, um, if you modify every other base, then it's cheaper. So for, for cost sake, we, we do every other base. Then it targets the, the poison exon. It will do steric blocking, and you get the um, exon to be um, trans translated into the protein. So that's how the ASOs work. And um, the reason for this, I think I've explained it, that they rely on vaccine and crit hybridization, and they are going to elicit their effects by either downward, knocking down the, the poison transcripts or upregulating the useful transcript to get more, pro, like higher production of that food. All right, so this is the mechanism of action. So for our government ASOs, they, um, they are going to work on pre-mRNA and our maximum ASOs can uh, also work on pre-mRNA, but GAPMA can work on pre-mRNA or mRNA. The difference between pre-mRNA and mRNA is that pre-mRNA is mRNA that is made in the nucleus that hasn't been transported to the cytoplasm. So the GAPMA is able to penetrate into the nucleus and elicit its effect. can also work on the mRNA, but the maximum ASOs work specifically in the nucleus. So they go in there, it hybridizes, then it recruits RNSH, RNSH will cut it up, and it will be cleaved. And this will be further degraded. And for the MISMA ASOs, that one also, so this is our SNP, this is our point mutation, so it will cause steric blocking so that um, it skips, the, the, this is skipped and the protein is made, like the transcript is made for the, pro the protein to be um, translated. And, um, so um, how do we do drug screening with um, all of this, with um, ASOs? So all I'm saying is that we have a child that is autistic. Um, we take a sample, your blood sample, your skin sample, because we are working with iPSCs, we are going to reprogram them there's the skin cells, the somatic cells into iPSCs. And once we have the iPSCs, we are going to generate neurons in a dish. And we test, this is gen, a personalized medicine. So that drug that we are testing is not going to work for two people. It's going to work for just one person. 
because the genes are like um, your genetic makeup is the, fine. The, the human genome has similar, like uh, I'll say, um, no two people. You might have some mutations that some person might not have. So this is strictly for one person. So if you're making the drug for you, it's just for you. Yeah. So um, you generate your neurons in a dish. You apply your ASOs. Then we are going to extract RNA, and we are going to sequence it, and we are going to analyze your transcriptome, and we are going to compare this with an, a healthy person to see the gene and the relative transcript abundances. And from there, if it works, it's going to go into talk studies. So right now we have ASOs that are in phase two clinical trials. We have ASOs that are in phase three clinical trials. What I do is I do preclinical studies. So I, do, I generate a cell-based model, and I test the, the ASOs on them to see if it works. If it works, then good. It can go into talk studies. Yeah. So this is like a disease in a dish. This is how we have it at day zero, and differentiation day two, day four, day seven. Um, I think I should give you some background too. So um, you might want to ask me, how do you get the um, iPSCs to be differentiated into neurons? So if you have your iPSCs first, um, to follow a neuronal differentiation pathway, you need your iPSCs to be by expressing NGN2. It's a, a gene that, um, is involved in neuronal differentiation. So to get your iPSCs to be expressed over expressing this gene, you are going to transfect them with a, a virus that is carrying the NGN2 gene in the 5' and 3' UTR. So what we do is that we have a plasmid, and we put this NGN2 in there, and we transfect hex cells with the, um, the virus, the, the third generation of the virus, that, so that the hex cells begin to overexpress this gene. Then now we infect your iPSCs with the hex cells. So your, your iPSCs begin to um, overexpress this gene. Now when this gene, when you're overexpressing this gene and we put on doxycycline on it, automatically it's going to go into neuronal differentiation over three weeks. And after three weeks, we have your neurons in a dish. And now we can screen the drugs against them. So we screen the drugs at different concentration. We start from a lower dose, and we gradually increase. Yeah, so yeah, so it works. And when it works, it goes into talk studies. So it's a process. Then from talk studies, we check safety, efficacy. So it's not just one person doing the work. I mean, the, several, um, I would say, departments, so yeah. And after talk studies, we submit an IND to the FDA. If it is approved, then it goes into clinical trials. It goes into phase one, phase two, phase three. We submit an NDA to the FDA again, then we have a drug. So basically, yeah. Then after the drug is made, we also have a phase four that is like post-marketing surveillance where we are checking for, because these studies are done in like, I would think like a smaller population. Now the drug is, is going out there. This is for a general drug. When the drug is going out there, it's going to go into like millions and millions of people and you want to check for safety. Maybe someone is having um, a genetic disorder and is taking a specific drug and you don't want that to have an effect. So yeah, we do post-marketing surveillance just to um, check the drug how the drug is doing on the market. And um, this is a lab that I work with. It's the Gleason lab at BCSC. And we work on um, pediatric brain diseases. We work on epilepsy, autism.
Yeah, big applause for Charlotte. Uh, very prestigious lab, and they're, they're doing great research. So, um, yeah, great. One thing I forgot to mention that I alluded to earlier is um, why Obama un uh, undoing the ban on stem cell research was largely symbolic. You might remember that in 2007, they discovered induced pluripotent stem cells. They are completely identical to embryonic stem cells. So at that point, we don't need embryonic stem cells. We can do the same studies if you have an embryonic stem cell and then induced pluripotent stem cell next to each other. You can't tell them apart. There's no test for it. You wouldn't know. So yeah, he unbent them two years after that discovery. At that point, it was. No. So this is the, the research that I'm doing, uh, which is on cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a lung disease. And it's an autosomal recessive genetic disorder. Um, what you've got to understand from this is that it's a genetic disorder. And the inheritance of it is rather, well, it's not strong. Both parents have to carry the gene in order for you to get cystic fibrosis. And what it does is that there is an ion channel in your body that's expressed in a bunch of different tissues, a bunch of different organs, and this ion channel doesn't function right. So that means that water and salt doesn't, um, doesn't accumulate in your tissues the way it's supposed to accumulate. It means that um, your mucus is really thick. And that's a problem. Yeah, it doesn't sound too bad, but it's a huge problem. Like your organs are coated in mucus. Think of your intestines. Think of your um, lungs. Think of your, your nose and all the other mucus you have going on in your body. So these are just um, some of the symptoms. So the respiratory system is um, Impacted, it's pretty rough. This is usually what people die from who have cystic fibrosis. Um, they just accumulate lung damage throughout their lives. Um, they, it, and it just gets worse and worse. So they have really frequent um, respiratory, respiratory infections like pneumonia. They cup up blood, their lung collapses, and at, you know, usually around the age of 35. They with treatments, we've been getting a better prognosis, but it's still a horrible disease to suffer from. There is also some other systems that are impacted, like I said, the intestines, because the intestinal lining is so thick you can't absorb food the same way, so people suffer from malnutrition. Um, if you think about all the mucus that's going in in uh, the reproductive system, um, yeah, males have infertility because the mucus is just and has some, uh, has some other problems too. So this is what I did research on. Um, unlike autism, which has a really complex genetic background, cystic fibrosis is caused by a single gene. But it's a huge gene, and it's um, vastly complicated. This is the map of the gene. These are all the different mutations that can occur in the gene. And because of its sheer size, it's a really difficult disease to So what I do research on specifically is just class one mutations. Uh, as Charlotte said earlier, the DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and the RNA gets transcribed into a protein, translated into a protein. Proteins are the functional units of the body. Any disease you have is connected to a protein, um, because they're the ones that do all the work. So if you have a disease, some protein somewhere is not working. In cystic fibrosis, it's the cystic fibrosis uh, transmembrane regulator protein, so the CFTR protein. And class one mutations specifically uh, mean that there is no protein being produced. So this is the worst type, worst type of mutation you can have in cystic fibrosis. Uh, you really need, uh, you need it to breathe. So. Yeah, people who have this type of mutation live the shortest. So what we're trying to do is, in the genetic code, there is three letters that always start 
the G, which is A U G in this in this order, and it's really required for the gene to start being made into a protein. It doesn't just happen anywhere. And what we can do is we can change the genetic code to have um, different sequences around the start codon. Let's say if you have an A here, then the protein is going to be made more often. If you have a G here, the protein is going to be made extra more often. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put the right genetic sequence around the start codon so more protein is going to be made. And what I spend most of my day on is taking um, patient samples, so cells from people with, CF, uh, with cystic fibrosis. And I make their cells into induced pluripotent stem cells, and then I use those induced pluripotent stem cells to make a lung in a dish that has their specific brand and mutation of cystic fibrosis, and then I try to fix that. Um, this takes about 70 days from, from IPSCs all the way to a mature, mature lung in the dish. These are the different proteins that I have to add during this um, procedure, which is important because proteins are incredibly expensive. I mean, 10 nanograms of this, of any protein really, which can fit in a vial this small, is about $500, sometimes six. And I'm using like 20 different ones of it, so you can expand, uh, you can really imagine how expensive this process is. How do they get the protein? Um, great question. So it's it's an industry of its own. First, you have to determine which protein you need, which is a whole scientific ordeal on its own. But what they do nowadays is, um, like with insulin, in the early days, they just um, killed a bunch of pigs and extracted the insulin out of the pancreas of the pig and then gave it to people. Um, nowadays, the way insulin is made is that they take the genetic sequence for insulin, they put it in a bacteria, and they have the bacteria make the insulin for us. And that's pretty much the same for every other protein being made too. But it's a really um, difficult process because not every protein is equally well made. Not every protein gets um, is easily purified, so it uh, it really varies. Like one protein is available in bulk for relatively cheap, another protein is going to be incredibly expensive, thousands of dollars for a very tiny amount. So once I have my little lung in a dish, I hook it up to this machine, which is called the husing chamber, and I can, at, at this point, the lung is such a good model for the disease that it needs air. So my uh, my samples, my little ones in the dish, they are cultured in what you call a trans well. So it means that the top is open, so it can get some air. It's, it's required at that point for the tissue culture to stay healthy. And this electric device measures the actual activity of this um, of this protein, like like you would in a so, yeah, and that is the research that I do, and that concludes the presentation. Thank you, thank you. Um, any questions relating to stem cells, careers, um, pharmaceutical industry stuff? really depends what purpose for, right? So um, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, perhaps I can go back, there is about 10,000 um, different clinical trials for stem cells right now, but only about 1,000 of them are in uh, phase three, which is 
a better way to look at it is there's a thousand clinical trials in phase three that involve stem cells. But like I said, currently there's only 27 approved and they are for very specific purposes, usually for mesenchymal stem cells, uh, which produce blood and um, yeah, bone marrow related stuff. Um, I would say lungs, for instance, are one of the most difficult things to grow. And um, yeah, you can call me out on it. Um, call me 15 years later. I'm pretty sure that it's going to be one of the last organs that it's been that we would be able to make a dish or free imprint and implant into a person. Other stuff like a kidney might be a lot easier, so we might see that in the next 10, 15 years. Thank you. So how does your research translate to clinical trials? What's the process that it takes to make it as a clinical trial? Yeah, so what you have to do uh, to develop a product that's going to be clinically viable is once you have something that works, once you identify a protein, a small drug, a biologic, um, an ASO, you have to do um, what they call free clinical studies. These are toxicology studies, studies done in animal studies, done in cultures, like cell cultures. And if you have good enough data, you can you can go to the FDA and apply for what is called an IND, an initial drug, um, initial drug filing, initial drug designation. Well, one of those, <laughs> an initial drug application. Yeah, um, if you get approved by the FDA, then you can start human trials. First, uh, a phase one trial would be a, a dose finding study. So they try to see the highest dose that's not toxic to humans. It takes about one to two years. Then a phase two clinical study is going to, um, going to determine efficacy to see if, if your drug is really um, useful for people. That takes another three to four years. And then a phase three clinical study is going to look at the long-term effects. And once you went through all of this, which takes about 10 years and $2 billion, then you can apply again for um, for the drug filing. What is it called? The yeah, yeah. A, a new drug application, exactly. Then you can apply for a new drug application. So. Um, does that answer the question or were you asking about my drug specifically? Yes, that's the process for uh, getting the drug through FDA approval. Uh, Returning to uh, the autism thing, with what purpose do do we take do we take and reproduce those mutations that make autism? Do you plan to reprogram the children with autism, or simply treat their symptoms? So there's so there's a there's a foundation called the N. Lawrence Foundation. So um, the kids, so you go to the hospital and they diagnose you of autism. And we realize that, um, so there are different types of genes, but the genes I'm talking about are genes that have SNPs in them. So it means they have just a new single nucleotide change and that can be seen in like 1% of the population, or 1% of the population. So you go there and see that you are, you are autistic, you fall into that category, and there's no hope for you, then you are recruited into the, um, it's, I don't know, it's like a foundation, and they are funding this for kids with autism, and it's, the medication is going to go for them for free. Yes, but, not, but what I specifically want to emphasize is, do you, are you intended to reprogram and get rid of the autism? So we, we will work the program what? Are you intending to get rid of the autism? Yes, yeah, so we are we want phenotypic improvement and we are going to we want to reverse the um, preclinical endpoint studies. Yes. Yes, they want to reverse the autism. We want to reverse, yeah. Okay. So the clinical endpoints are what 
the end point of the disease that we want we see in the child. So we want to reverse that, that preclinical end point. Okay. Any other questions? I'll ask you first, Charlotte. So I think kind of piggybacking on that. Um, so the idea is that uh, you were talking about the um, DNA sequences, right? With either side, you have uh, something attached. I forgot the term you used. In, in one instance, uh, I, for, I forgot the, it's a, the mer words that you used. The, the gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the gap. I think okay. Martin was on it. So in, in one instance, you're you're looking at a, the gap mer. It, it's a mechanism to inhibit the production of the abnormal protein that causes autism. And so is, it, is that what you're using for treatment? Is the idea to yes. use this type of DNA? Yes. This, uh, that basically, is, it's a... The ASO that we are using the is ASO. a gamma ASO. So the, maybe you can explain what the term oligonucleotide is. I think that's that's the treatment itself, right? So and, yeah. So it's a, a, the type it's of molecule that it is and how you would put that into a So the gamma is a short stress of, um, stretch of DNA, basically 10 nucleotides long. Then... Um, we flunk the edges, five, five nucleotides. We modify five nucleotides such that it becomes the antisense of the pre-mRNA transcript that the, um, the gene is producing. The op like the opposite sequence. The opposite, yeah. yes. So we modify this end so that this can bind to this Watson and Craig based hybridization. And so and that is the treatment. Correct? Yeah, so this, this oligonucleotide yeah, is yeah, what you're yeah, that's what hoping you're to put doing. into a patient. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. To so then try to prevent yeah. that abnormal protein that's the root that cause is, of okay, yeah. that's what we're doing. Martin, I'm sorry. No, you I just wanted to know if someone wanted, if students wanted to pursue this as a career, what would be like a good major or field of study for them to start with? So um, you can do neuroscience, biotech. Yeah. Those two would be really yeah. good. Very good. Um, how about you, Mark? Um, really anything biology adjacent. So developmental biology for stem cells specifically is good one, biology, biochemistry would um, probably most be the most rigorous one, but also just plain chemistry or mechanic chemistry. So I came from environmental science and I'm doing just fine. So really anything uh, biology related can get you pretty far. Thank you. Let's go back to when you're doing an IPS patient, you're doing Yes? Um, would you, um, would it ever be possible to use 
stem cell um, grown organs for um, experiments or drug tests instead of using like live people or animals? Or is that not feasible? That is currently the only thing that's feasible. Oh. That's what uh, both I and, and Charlotte especially are doing. And um, we can't grow a whole organ yet, but we can grow a pretty substantial tissue sample. Like let's say um, neurons that resemble mature neurons in the brain, or tissue um, tissue cell, I mean lung cells that resemble mature uh, lung epithelial cells in the lung. It's not a whole organ, but it's really close. It's sufficient to test the drugs. Yes, and the whole. Um, the whole advantage of this is that if you have a genetic disorder with a specific mutation, maybe no one else in the entire world has this mutation. But if we take your fibroblasts, we take your skin cells, and we make iPSCs out of them, the reported stem cells, we can then generate whatever problem you have in whatever organ, lung, brain, and it's going to have your mutation specific. You can develop drugs for that one mutation specifically. It's just expensive. Yes. Oh, how you, yes. How do you um, extract someone's neurons? You don't. Okay. Yes, that's um, that's why um, these stem cells are such a big deal for especially brain research, because you can't just get a sample of someone's neurons. Yeah. It's really difficult. Get. So that's why you can uh, guide these stem cells along the differentiation path to become more specialized until they become basically neural cells. And they should be completely identical in, uh, with the ones in your brain, except you didn't have to take them out. Yes? Yes. Um, how do you get the